These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. Hittite king Mershali II has a lot on his plate. In only a few years, he's managed to wipe out a threat in the West that had eluded even his brilliant father, then battled against a novel form of the northern threat in the form of a somewhat united Kaskan kingdom slaying the king and dispersing the nomads before they had a chance to grow into something truly terrifying. All this while dealing with the effects of a plague that's creating corpses and empty fields throughout the empire. Thus far, the youngest son of Shapililiuma has proven himself quite adept at handling matters, and has by now matured into a king worthy of the best Hittite rulers. He does have one advantage that previous kings have not enjoyed. He hasn't had to worry at all about his eastern flank. Not only is Egypt in chaos thanks to the transition from the 18th to 19th dynasties and Mitanni is pretty well destroyed, but also down in Syria he has two older brothers loyally managing the southeast on his behalf. Telepanu rules from Aleppo and manages internal affairs, keeping vassals in line, appeasing the gods, and dispensing justice when necessary. Shari Kasha, meanwhile, ruled in Karchemish and was responsible for military matters on this front. Neither of these two tend to get much historical credit, with Mershali being claimed as responsible for pretty much everything. And so while it's hard to clearly assign responsibility for things, likely these two experienced brothers played a key role in the Hittite government's successes in these years. With Mershali's seventh year on the throne, three Syrian vassals revolt, the lands of Nuhashi and Kadesh, as well as a minor king named en Erta. It isn't clear why, but Egyptian meddling is strongly suspected, though the growing power of Assyria may also have been at play. The matter comes to revolve around a king of Nuhashi named Teta, who declares himself independent, likely as a first step in gaining an Egyptian alliance. Mershali dealt with this by quickly identifying that Teta had a quite reasonable brother with whom the Hittites could deal, and this brother, Shumitara, was promised the kingship of Nuhashi if he could simply kill his brother from within the palace. Shumitara, while agreeing that both a Hittite alliance and his being king were good ideas, arrested his brother and usurped the throne. Shumitara, however, did not kill Tete, merely imprisoned or perhaps exiled him. While this was being sorted out, Mershali made his first royal appearance in Syria for the fairly minor matter of crushing the tiny king en Erta. With two allies gone and a Hittite army marching their way, Kadesh quickly sent a note insisting that oh, some mistake has been made somewhere, and maybe everyone could just forgive and forget. Mershili, in his infinite mercy, or perhaps in a realistic analysis of the cost of changing kings in Kadesh, allowed them to return to the Hittite fold without fighting. Mershili was able to return to Anatolia early that year and release many of his civilian soldiers to return to their fields in time for the harvest. However, just as Mershili had returned home, the exiled former king of Nuhashi, Tete, rallied a mercenary army and retook the Nuhashi capital. Mershili was forced to delegate the reconquest to Shari Kasha, but right as the Syrian garrison arrived at Nuhashi, they received word that an Egyptian force had also arrived to support their new client state. Shari Kasha was able to get a few Hittite reinforcements, but the issue was so dire that he felt it necessary to reach out to a number of vassals, including the city of Ugarit, for even more troops. He even promised to the king of Ugarit that if the king showed initiative, then Ugarit would be able to keep anything it plundered, land, slaves, or goods for itself which was a fairly costly promise for the Hittites, since reintegrating Nuhashi after despoiling it would be more difficult than simply winning than letting them back in with forgiveness. The campaign was not an easy one. 
We have no details, but it got bad enough that Mershali began preparing a second expedition to return to Syria and assist. But as he was about to depart, he received a message from his brother that the rebels and Egyptians had been defeated, and Nuhashi was once again Hittite land. But even though there's more to be said about the matter of Nuhashi, Mershali doesn't have time for it yet. In the same year as the Nuhashi crisis, the northern mountain kingdom of Azihayasa, which had supposedly been a vassal for over a generation now, came down from the mountains, assaulted the Hittite province of Dankua, and enslaved a large number of its people. Mershali sent a letter to the king asking politely that they return the Hittite subjects, and the king, not so politely, refused. And so in the eighth year, Mershili went to war in the north. The section of Mershili's chronicle that would have told us about this campaign is mostly broken off. But it's clear that the fighting was hard, the terrain was hostile, and at the end of the eighth year, the enemy had not yet been subdued. With the dawn of the ninth year, Mershili likely hoped to handle the matter of the north quickly and return home. But in this year, nothing seemed to go right for the great king. First off, the northwest Anatolian land of Pala, located on the Black Sea coast, rebelled, and Mershali was obliged to send a general and a portion of his army over there. Soon after that, oracles revealed the cause of the god's divine anger, which continued to manifest in the form of a massive plague that was still running unchecked through Hittite lands. A messenger arrived in Mershali's camp and informed him that Hepat of Kumani, a goddess located in Kizawatna, was languishing from neglect. The king himself was meant to see to her needs every year, but Shapililiuma had neglected her for his entire reign, and Mershali had done it no better up until now. If this goddess was not immediately appeased, far worse could befall the kingdom. And so, to keep the heavenly stability of the universe intact, Mershali abandoned the northern campaign, leaving a general and a garrison behind to go and attend the goddess. At the temple, he made humble apologies for his father's errors, and came to offer restitution and make the goddess happy again. While Mershali was in Kizawatna, he had his brother Shari Kashyap postpone military operations until the matters of faith had been finished. With the goddess attended to, Shari Kashyap was summoned for a strategy meeting to discuss matters of both defense on multiple fronts and relating to certain family issues that had begun to crop up. This meeting, however, proved that whatever gods the Hittites had angered were not yet satisfied, for as the meeting was wrapping up, Shari Kusha fell ill and died. There was no man in the empire who was both as competent and trustworthy, leaving Mershali bereft of a crucial advisor and ally. Then, word reached Mershali that Azihayasa had defeated the force that had been left up north. The northern province of Ishtitina had already been plundered and depopulated, and the city of Kanuwara was under siege. Then, before Mershali could act on this, he learned that the land of Nuhashi had again risen in revolt. In the time it took for an army to be assembled, the Assyrians, who have quickly become a threat to rival everything the Mitanni had ever been, found out about Shari Kushut's death and took the opportunity to lay siege to his city of Karchemish. Then, his other brother, Telepanu, who had been assisting with internal matters from the city of Aleppo, also caught ill and died. Mershali now has three fronts to defend, right as his best general and his best domestic ally have died, but this isn't going to stop him. Mershali is a fine commander of troops, but we see him solving this crisis, and dealing with crises before this, in a way that's starting to become more common among the Hittite Empire. In previous eras, it was either quite rare for a king to give command of an army to a general, or it was quite rare for him to admit it in the histories, which, from our perspective, kind of looks the same. 
with Mershili, we have the first Near Eastern king, aside perhaps from the Egyptians, I'm not an expert on them, to frequently send and frequently admit to sending generals to all corners of his empire. And of course, this is hugely dangerous. Just ask the Romans what a standing army with independent generals can do to your empire, which is, of course, why previous kings have tried to be personally in charge of their army to the greatest extent possible. I should note that Mershali is definitely not the first king to use generals, not by a long shot. But of the men we have good records for, I've not yet seen anyone employing so many in such critical times. Recall that when Shapilaliuma had to fight on multiple fronts, he solved this by taking his one army and then just winning very quickly on each front. Mershali, however, dispatches a general and an army to the north to deal with Azihayasa, another to the south, where the Nuhashi Rebellion has again dragged Kadesh and a few other tiny kingdoms into open revolt. Mershali himself took the rest of the army and headed east to Karchemish to take a look at this new Assyrian threat for himself. And let's pause again to consider just how massive the Hittite army is now that it can afford to split off in three directions like this and still credibly face each opponent. At this point in history, estimates of the size of an army that the Hittites can call up range from 20,000 to as many as 50,000 men. This includes mercenaries, vassals, militia, conscripts, and perhaps as many as 10,000 full-time professional Hittite soldiers. Nowhere in the world has seen a military as large as the Hittite one under Mershali up to this point. Egypt can, if it wants to, call up perhaps even more men, but as yet, we haven't seen a need for it to do so. The first hassle in all this came when the general for the northern expedition sent a message to Mershili, announcing that he was unable to continue. Once he had completed all his preparations, he had consulted the gods to make sure that this campaign was acceptable to them. This is pretty standard practice for all Hittite and really all Near Eastern generals uh, throughout all of ancient history. And in fact, we see it with the Romans as well and even later. However, the auguries in this case were unfavorable, and it required the king himself to intervene ritually with the gods, offering a great deal of prayer and sacrifices. Then the king had to send a message back to the northern general in order to have him repeat the omens. This time, thankfully, the omens were favorable. And when the northern general marched against Azihayasa, he defeated them so soundly that the Northlands would remain secure for the rest of Mershali's reign. In the south, the gods' favor was apparently not an issue. Nuhashi was crushed by the Hittite army, and when they approached Kadesh, the southern general was able to convince someone within the city to assassinate the Kadeshi king. The assassination came quickly, and the city fell soon after. When the assassin was later carried over to Mershali's court for his justly deserved reward, the pious king was put in a bit of a bind. He could hardly fail to reward what was loyalty to the Hittite Empire, but he could also hardly condone an act of family murder. After all, Mershali himself was dealing with the fallout from just such an act, which had been one of the things that had irritated the gods enough to send the plague that by now had killed all of Mershali's brothers and his dearly beloved wife. And so Mershali compromised. He announced before heaven and all the gods that this assassin was to be cursed in the sight of the gods, announced that it was legal for anyone in the Hittite empire to hunt and murder this criminal. Then, he gave him the throne of Kadesh. With this taken care of, Mershali marched on Karchemish and was able to take it from the badly overextended Assyrians, apparently without too much fuss. With this crisis of his ninth year fairly well concluded, Mershali spent his tenth regnal year in Syria setting things right. 
He drafted a number of treaties with his Syrian vassals, none of which are terribly interesting on their own right, but taken together represent a reaffirming of Hittite control in the region. Additionally, he set his nephews, the sons of the dead Telepanu and Shari Kusha, on the thrones of Aleppo and Karchemish, establishing those cities as viceroyalties within the lines of the Hittite royal family. He also set a few other rulers on a few other thrones of various vassal states. Then he went back to Hattusha and surveyed all that he'd done in his first decade of his king. He was so proud of it that he ordered a memoir be written, which survives to this day, and is the reason we're able to give such a detailed year-by-year -year account of his reign. However, he will continue to be king for another 15 or so years, and it's in these years that he will be far more focused on the affairs of the gods and the crucial matter of extirpating his family's sin before the gods annihilate the Hittite Empire. Mershili has a reputation among modern historians as being by far the most pious of Hittite kings. This comes from having written at least 12 major prayers that survive to this day, plus his occasional documented concerns about doing right before the gods. If he was, in fact, unusually pious, I think that some of the acts which stick out most from his career do the best job of showing us how ideas of what makes a good person have changed radically since the Bronze Age. He showed no hesitation in annihilating the nation of Arzawa, but he spared a neighboring kingdom because of an old woman's plea. We just saw the curious incident where he both condemned and rewarded an assassin, and he was so scrupulous with his divinations and rituals that he would delay or even abandon campaigns based on the commands of the gods. At the same time, it's also possible that he was just as pious as most Hittite rulers, but because we have such a detailed account written by Mershali himself, or more likely under Mershali's direct instruction instead of being written by a successor, we may see more of his pious activities than we do in other documents. Or perhaps he really was just a better and more godly man than the rest of his lineage. There's no real way to know for sure. In any case, we have much less sense of what Mershley does with his final decade or perhaps 15 years on the throne. Additionally, we have no clear way to date the many prayers that we have from this king. Therefore, most histories treat the matter of the plague and his family issues as occurring in Mershley's later reign. The truth is, though, he was likely praying over the matter of this plague since day one, and is pretty likely that his first wife died of it sometime in his pretty early years. The plague prayers themselves, for the most part, are quite like the sorts of medicinal prayers we looked at extensively back in episode 79. At the heart of all of them, Mershali knows exactly why people are inexplicably dying. It's because the gods have been somehow offended. In modern outbreak of diseases, we're comforted by the knowledge that there's a very clear and definite procedure to follow. In our case, that procedure is quarantine practicing good hygiene, and waiting for a cure to be developed. A cure might take a long time, but we have faith that no matter how long it takes the doctors and the scientists, they're still doing their best. We don't lose faith in the modern medicine system just because not everything has a cure and because not all of the treatments are completely effective. We understand the underlying principles going on, and we have faith in them. Similarly, Mershali has a clear and definite procedure to follow, which includes quarantines, good hygiene, and patience while the cure was delivered from the gods. If it took 20 years for the gods to clear the plague, at no point did Mershali ever lose faith in the gods, because the will of the gods is ultimately inscrutable. But that doesn't mean Mershali did nothing. 
Just as the modern medical system needs to be funded in order to deliver vaccines, Mershley made sure that the temples were well taken care of, his natural piety amplified by the needs of the times he lived through. The plague prayers are rather famous, at least as far as Hittite literature goes, though like I said, most of them repeat general themes we've already seen in prayer both among the Hittites and the other Near Easterners. For those interested in Hittite religion, you've probably already encountered these, but just as a reference, I will link a little translation over on oldeststories.net. There are praises for the gods and recognition that divine will is inscrutable. But what makes them interesting, taken together, is that they describe Mershali's search for the causes of the god's anger. He takes multiple auguries and reads the omens, or perhaps the priests do these things under his instruction, and he comes up with multiple possibilities. Ultimately, he concludes that his father, who he clearly loved and respected greatly given all the things he wrote about Shapililiuma, was at fault for he had offended the gods in three ways. First, he'd neglected, for his entire reign, a certain ritual sacrifice to the god Mala, who was the Euphrates River. Second, he had violated his peace with the Egyptians, which, even though we know that from Shippililiuma's point of view, he took great pains to paint himself as the victim in that situation, it's pretty clear even from Mershali's standpoint, that Shapililiuma had really been the one starting things. Now, this piece was sworn to the gods, and thus was a blasphemy when he violated it. Thirdly, he murdered his brother to take the throne, after having sworn loyalty to him, another oath-breaking. It isn't clear if Mershali considers all three of these to be of equal importance, but he believed that as Shapililiuma's son, the burden of paying these divine debts had passed on to him. The plague letters reveal very little of what the disease actually was. It discusses the widespread and high fatalities, and really it's hard to underestimate just how devastated the entire region was. But these plague prayers are notably short on symptoms, meaning that modern historians and doctors and uh, apparently there are historian doctors as well, uh, cannot even guess at the nature of this plague, which is a bit disappointing. Interestingly, these same plague prayers consider the rash of rebellions and foreign incursions to be part of the same disease, both being caused by the god's displeasure. It's estimated that the plague continued for perhaps 20 years, eating up most of Mershley's reign, and was probably the cause of one of the most serious personal tragedies in his life, the death of his first wife. Mershley's first wife was never queen. The Babylonian princess, daughter of Bernaburiash, who had married Shippililiuma, and thus was Mershley's stepmother, was still alive. And so long as she lived, she held the title of Tawanana. Now, the Tawanana in this case, was trouble, and had been even while Shapililiuma had lived. She represented the alliance between Hattusha and Babylon, a precious diplomatic link in a region quite hostile to Hittite expansionism, and as such could get away with pretty much anything. When she stole treasures from the palace, and even embezzled from the cults of the gods themselves, there really wasn't anyone in a position to rebuke her. Mershali's brothers, who had all been senior to him before his kingship, had felt powerless against this highly important diplomatic representative who was also a senior member of the royal household, and Mershali seems to have been no less cowed. And so, as her behavior was endlessly tolerated, it grew endlessly more profligate and wasteful. Her personal expenses multiplied, and the treasures of the kingdom were lavished on worthless hangers-on. Some band of sycophants and enablers attracted to the Tawanana like birds around an old lady with breadcrumbs. Then, Mershali's wife fell ill. It's often hard to tell how loving the royal households of antiquity were. Now, modern experience does tell us in certain countries that arranged marriages can often form quite warm households. 
but history also tells us that the power and majesty of being a king is often incompatible with the sort of give and take necessary for true love to flourish. However, there can be little doubt that Mershley was in fact in love with Gashali Yawiya, who he may have married while he was still Shapililiyuma's youngest son, and thus of a bit less diplomatic importance than the wife of a great Hittite king perhaps should have been. We have portions of two prayers from Mershali on behalf of his wife. First to the sun goddess of Arina, a patron deity of the royal household, and the other to a native Hattian goddess Lelwani, who was apparently Gashali Yawiya's personal goddess. Listen to this bit here. If you, O God, my Lord, are seeking some evil in my wife, I herewith send you an adorned substitute. Compared to me, my wife is excellent. She is pure, she is radiant, she is pale, she is endowed with everything good. Examine her, O God, my Lord. Let this woman go back and forth before the God, my Lord. May you turn again in favor towards my wife, your great daughter, and save her from this sickness. Remove from her this sickness and let her recover. And then it will come to pass in the future that the great daughter will constantly praise you, O God, and she will constantly invoke only your name, O God. Now certainly, prayer can involve overblown flattery at times, but we have good reason to think that Mershley's assessment of his wife is genuine. Because despite these two prayers, and quite many more that probably were written but haven't survived, Gashli Yawiya died of her illness. Mershley was deeply upset when his wife died, another thing which tells us about the quality of their relationship, and his fury pointed squarely at his stepmother, the Tawanana. As Tawanana, the Queen Mother was responsible for passing these sorts of prayers along to the gods, but in Mershley's fury, he penned a formal accusation before the gods themselves, and possibly also before a domestic court, listing every sort of sin that the Tawanana had committed. As mentioned, she had been profligate, spending first her entire dowry, which was big no-no, on gathering a group of loyal followers, and then begun to dip into the state treasury, then the literal treasures of the palace and holy cults. If she had done only this, Mershley tells us, he was prepared to tolerate it, given her position in the royal family and her position diplomatically. However, when it came to the matter of Mershley's wife, she had been deficient in passing along Mershley's earnest prayers to the gods. More remarkably, she had apparently cast curses on the entire family and even hired a conjurer to help murder Gashli Yawiya. And then, in the tenth year of Mershley's reign, there was a solar eclipse, which almost certainly tells us that Mershley's tenth year on the throne was 1312 BCE. The Tawanana, employing the very early development of Babylonian astrology, took this as a sign that it was time to murder Mershali and replace him with one of her own sons. Now, the relationship between this conspiracy and the murder of Mershali's wife is unclear, for the relevant parts of the tablet are broken away, but ultimately, Mershali feels like he is being punished for the sins of both his mother and his father, while he himself has lived scrupulously according to the omens and divinations sent by the gods. In a final plague tablet, Mershley quite passionately calls out to the gods, insisting, O oh gods, set this case down before yourselves and investigate it. How has Tawanana's life gone bad? Because she's alive! She sees the sun god of heaven with her eyes and eats from the bread of life. And my punishment is the death of my wife. How has it gone any better? Because she killed her. Every day of my life, my soul goes down to the dark netherworld to visit my wife, and it's anguish for me. The Tawanana has bereaved me. 
don't you, O oh gods, recognize who was really punished here? This is a man wrestling with the gods in a way somewhat different than we see in the theistic literature, like the famous poem of the righteous sufferer. But he's clearly operating in the same philosophical framework that we've become accustomed to, just expressing his grief with less filter, because apparently no one edits the words of kings. But even with this pain in his soul, Mershali proved pious to the last. The oracles following this accusation gave the king two options. The gods permitted him to either execute the queen or depose her, and he chose the more dangerous but more pious option, removing the Tawanana from her position, but retiring her to a luxurious villa in the country and seeing to her needs for the rest of her life. This choice was politically risky and emotionally quite painful for the king, but ultimately it seems it was more correct in the eyes of the gods, for soon after this, the plague, having raged for twenty years now, slowly petered out and allowed Mershali to rule his final years with the satisfaction that he had pleased the gods. Sometime in the waning years of his life, Mershali was able to move on a bit and took a second wife, a Hurrian woman named Danuhepa, Quite a lot of controversy surrounds this woman, including the question of whether she existed at all, or if there were multiple Danuhepas, but it seems clearest to assume that there was just the one Danuhepa. She married Mershali sometime in the final decade of his rule, and would, like Mershali's stepmother, come to cause severe problems in later reigns. For now, though, we know very little of Danuhepa, except that she's busy being a wife and having children in Mershali's final years. Mershali fought a number of military campaigns in his last two decades. There was a brief rebellion in western Anatolia, a follow-up to his tremendously successful conquest there, and the follow-up response was so thorough that there would be nothing more heard from this region for at least 20 more years. There were multiple campaigns against the northern Cascans, who were a seemingly endless problem at this point. They couldn't be exterminated and they couldn't be assimilated, and so they simply had to be fought on a regular basis. But unlike earlier kings, who were forced to fend off the Cascans while simultaneously dealing with other threats, Mershali had completely pacified the West. The east was the domain of the Assyrians, with whom he had an uneasy truce, and in the south, the Egyptians were occupied with the transition into the 19th dynasty. And so, for the first time, more or less ever, the Hittite Empire was able to focus its entire energies against the north, and Mershali campaigned in places that no Hittite king had ever managed to penetrate into. Most exceptionally, he was, after some two or three hundred years, able to reoccupy the holy northern city of Narek, a great triumph for the gods and the empire, and enabling the return of rituals that had long been neglected. However, the time was not yet right for a full recolonization, though it isn't clear if this was a matter of omens or of Cascan interference, for after the triumph the city would go unsettled for a little bit longer. Perhaps the largest effect of Mershali's military campaigns, however, even beyond the stability they provided to the Hittite Empire's borders after centuries of ceaseless warfare, was his policy of mass transportation. Mershali didn't invent the idea of transporting masses of enemy populations into Hittite lands. We've seen it at least since his namesake 300 years ago sacked Babylon, and from time to time even before that. But what Mershali did differently was to institute transportation on a massively larger scale than it had ever been done before. Over 30 years of constant warfare, we don't have clear numbers aside from the estimate of 65,000 taken out of Arzawa in that conquest, and occasionally mentions of hundreds and thousands from even fairly modest villages and towns, but almost certainly he moved over 100,000 people. 
That number may in fact be closer to 200,000 people resettled in various parts of the empire. An absolutely astonishing number, given the population of Anatolia at the time. Those people were something similar to slaves, but also something a bit better. Perhaps serf would be closest, for they were tied to the land and harshly punished for attempting to flee, including with blindings and mutilation for repeat offenders. But those who remained where they were and did their work, it was likely that life was quite similar for a transportee even after their movement. What the Hittite Empire needed was not slaves in the way that we think of them nowadays. They needed farmers and herdsmen to work the plots emptied by the endless casualties of Hittite warfare and, perhaps more importantly, to replace the populations lost in the 20 years of plague. Without this influx of forced immigration, the Hittite Empire may have collapsed 150 years early, hollowed out during Mershali's reign. Mershali's mass transportation campaign involved logistics on a scale much larger than what had been required by the previous plunder trains, for professional soldiers needed to be deployed all over the place to ensure that these captives were moved and kept healthy during the difficult and hazardous journey, then resettled successfully. And by all accounts, Mershali's transportation solutions, though we don't know the details of them, were so effective that aside from isolated runaways, there simply were no social or political problems that arose from these involuntary immigrant communities. No wide-scale rebellions, no noticeable cultural shifts, indeed very little mention of them at all, suggesting that they almost without exception integrated quickly and peaceably into their new homes. The example Mershley set would be remembered by kings generations later and become a major part of the strength of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. But we're a long way from that, and we'll be examining the transportation phenomenon there as well. Sometime in the later years of Mershley's reign, he was on the road during his endless travels when, during a thunderstorm, he appears to have suffered a minor stroke and for a time experienced a severe speech impediment, perhaps rendering him almost completely mute and leaving half his face slack. He had apparently been receiving prophetic dreams from the storm god for some time before that, and when the omens were taken, it was confirmed that the storm god of Manuzia, a deity that Mershley had engaged with before, who lived down in or around Kizawatna somewhere, was responsible. Traveling down to the Southern Temple and collecting the support of multiple gods along the way, Mershali engaged in a ritual in which his sins were transmitted onto an ox, who was then slaughtered. Mershali then bathed for seven days. As far as we can tell, this appears to have cured him, or at least enough to allow him to continue ruling for a number of years afterwards. Obviously, a modern secular outlook can insist that some stroke victims naturally recover over a period of a few weeks or months afterwards. But as far as Mershley was concerned, the sins which he had carried both from his own actions and inherited from his family were finally washed away, and the gods had granted him both healing and forgiveness in quite dramatic fashion. In 1295 BCE, Mershali II passed away after the, one of the most remarkable and eventful reigns of the Hittite Empire, holding together the empire his father had left him under the most extreme of stresses. Thanks to the great documentation he left us, both of himself and his father, we're able to tell better than nearly any other Hittite king that he was an earnest, intelligent and passionate man who ran himself ragged keeping the empire together, dying perhaps in his mid-fifties from sheer exhaustion and the complications of a life spent constantly on the move through the mountains and hills of Bronze Age Anatolia. There was no relaxing in luxurious palaces for Mershali. He lived in a time far too busy for that, a time when his empire could well have hollowed itself out in plague and succumbed to the very enemies that his father had so convincingly defeated. 
he would be succeeded by his son Muatali II, who lived through the dramatic reemergence of Egypt onto the world stage, with perhaps the most famous of all the many pharaohs of Egypt, a man named Ramesses. So join us next time as we take a look at this Muatali fellow and lay the groundwork for the greatest clash of empires in the late Bronze Age. Thank you for listening.